Welcome back to the Science Corner. We are working our way through the metabolic pathways needed to perform oxidative phosphorylation. And we left off now with the Krebs cycle. We have converted pyruvate into acetyl-CoA by that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and gotten the acetyl-CoA into the matrix of the mitochondria. So now we're into the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle. And the purpose of this cycle is to to accumulate electron carriers, specifically in the form of NADH and FADH2, which we can then use to donate electrons into the electron transport chain. Just as just a series of redox reactions. We're donating or reducing NAD plus to NADH, and then we'll reoxidize it and give off the elect its electrons to carrier proteins embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. To do this, we have to form the NADH and free up electrons that it can uptake. We go through a couple series state, series of oxidative decarboxylations. Um, and one of the most common ways we see that in nature is through beta cleavage. And that's exactly how we are going to decarboxylate our compounds in the Krebs cycle through beta cleavage, and you'll see that when we get to the reactions themselves. Another important part or fact of the Krebs cycle is that it's a convergent cycle, a mechanism. Other metabolites from various other metabolic pathways can feed into the Krebs cycle if glucose is insufficiently supplying the cycle. You can, you can supply um, the cycle through amino acids or even lipids. Amino acids through an intermediate of the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. And lipids can be, are converted are broken down and, and converted into acetyl-CoA, which obviously is fed into this Krebs cycle. All right, so let's work through these reactions. The first reaction is we're going to take acetyl-CoA and condense it with oxaloacetate to form citrate. By citrate synthase has a highly negative delta G naught prime value of negative 31.4. High free energy release um, enzymes, as we know, are highly regulated. And in this case, um, it's inhibited by the electron carrier NADH. The enzyme mechanism, which isn't so important, just in case you're interested, is um, analogous to that of a Perkins condensation, where a carbon-carbon bond is formed between a ketone and an ester. And here, our ketone, our keto group is the carbonyl group here, off of oxaloacetate. And our ester compound is being played by the acetyl-CoA with this carbonyl carbon attached to this thiol coenzyme A. And basically a base from the enzyme, some basic amino acid like histidine, lysine, or arginine, most likely histidine, will, do, will pick off this hydrogen from the terminal methyl group of acetyl-CoA, which then displaces its electrons onto the carbon to form this carbon-carbon bond. And in the process, since we have excess electrons on carbon, it gets pushed up on the oxygen, and that oxygen being highly electronegative, and with too many electrons, will pick off um, hydrogen from another residue of the enzyme, making a carbon carbox forming a hydroxyl group. Sorry about that. And we can see that here, this hydroxyl group right here on citrate. And we've now formed this six carbon compound. In the process, we've, we've introduced water. We've kind of reduced this molecule, these two molecules into one and, and released coenzyme A into solution. So in order to undergo these oxidative decarboxylations, we need to have um, we, we really can't re oxidize a tertiary alcohol because it's missing hydrogens off of its central carbon here. So first we need to isomerize citrate 
to make it a more oxidizable compound. And that's what the second reaction does. It converts citrate into isocitrate, an isomer of citrate, by aconitase. The delta G naught prime is slightly unfavorable, that being positive 6.7. But that's all right because the high, high concentrations of citrate in the matrix drives this reaction forward. And so as you can see from the chemical structures, we convert this tertiary compound into a tertiary alcohol into a secondary alcohol. Remember tertiary, this is a tertiary alcohol because the carbon to which the functional group or the hydroxyl group is attached is also attached to three other carbons. So here's our carbon attached to our hydroxyl group, and this carbon is attached to an addition to uh, three other carbons as well. Over here, though, we have a secondary alcohol because the carbon to which the hydroxyl group is attached to is only attached to two carbons. So we formed our secondary alcohol. We now have hydrogens we can pick off. The in this case, this is going to be the alpha carbon. So, we're going to perform beta cleavage between the alpha and beta carbon here. And basically, we're going to cut this bond and release that CO um, high car carboxylate group into solution as CO2. As you can see from this reaction, isocitrate is converted into alpha ketoglutarate with some intermediate by isocitrate dehydrogenase. And its name simply suggests that we are oxidizing our substrate, which we are doing. If you look, if you compare our substrate with our intermediate, we've lost this hydrogen. And we've also lost this hydrogen. And that's been go going to reduce NAD plus into NADH. With this extremely unstable carbonyl carbon with attached with carbon attached to a carboxylate group, it's extremely unstable, and therefore we perform beta cleavage as we suggested previously, right here, since this is our alpha carbon, our beta carbon. That it, this is our alpha carbon because the alpha carbon is considered the carbon off of which the carbon the carbon off of which the carbon our functional groups attached. So this is our functional group. This is the carbon attached to our functional group. Therefore, the carbon attached to that is the alpha carbon, and this would be the beta carbon. So you do beta cleavage, cleavage between the alpha and beta carbon. And that gets released as CO2, and we form alpha ketoglutarate. And I have this carbonyl oxygen compa carbonyl oxygen circled because if we simply replace this oxygen with an amine group we would have car gl glutamic acid or glutamate and this is the point at which we can feed amino acids into the citric acid cycle at this part at this stage at alpha ketoglutarate conversely if um, the TCA cycle or Krebs cycle is oversaturated, we can take alpha, alpha ketoglutarate out of the TCA cycle and make amino acids. Okay, so this is our first oxidative decarboxylation. We have now converted a six carbon compound into a five carbon compound. And the next reaction, the fourth reaction, will undergo another oxidative decarboxylation, the last oxidative, decarbo oxidative decarboxylation, to reform a four carbon compound. That is the conversion of alpha ketoglutarate into succinyl-CoA by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Similarly to citrate synthase, this reaction is highly, the delta G naught prime value is highly negative, negative 30. So this reaction is also regulated, and it is inhibited by NADH 
similarly to citrate synthase, as well as ATP. The alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is a complex um, structurally very similar to that of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And in fact, its mechanism is essentially the same as well. And it uses the same, it uses the same five cofactors. And therefore, we see the same kind of products released from this reaction. We get a reduction of NAD plus to NADH. We get a release of CO2. And we get an attachment of our coenzyme A to this terminal carbon. So now we have a four carbon compound, but this is a cycle, so we need to regenerate our oxaloacetate. So the next half of the cycle is just going to be devoted to getting this succinyl-CoA back into oxaloacetate. And we have to take this in a stepwise fashion in order to keep the free energy release relatively close to zero. If we had, if we had this go from succinyl-CoA to oxaloacetate in one step, it would most likely involve a very high delta G, positively high delta G not, not prime value, which would need us to give or put in some energy in the form of ATP in order for the reaction to go forward, for it to be favorable. And since here we're trying to create high energy compounds, the eventually by oxidati oxidative phosphorylation, we go instead choose to go through a series of, of smaller steps to keep that delta G naught prime value close to zero, and we do eventually reform our oxaloacetate. So the next reaction is the conversion of succinyl CoA. Oops, succinyl CoA into. Oops, sorry succinate by succinyl-CoA synthetase. This is a reversible reaction, as you can imagine, because the enzyme was actually discovered by the reverse reaction, succinyl-CoA synthetase, forming succinyl-CoA. So the, it was actually first discovered forming succinyl-CoA from succinate, but generally it's known that the forward re reaction is succinyl-CoA into succinate. We form GTP, we release our coenzyme A, and we form this four carbon symmetric compound succinate. Also important to note that GTP is readily converted into ATP, a more usable form of energy, by nucleoside diphosphate kinase. All right, so now we can see the delta G net prime values are relatively close to zero. It can flow in either direction. It's reversible. And now we're going to take our next smaller step back to oxaloacetate by converting succinate into fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase. It's a dehydrogenase. Therefore, you can safely assume that we are oxidizing succinate. And in fact, we are. You can see the carbons that we pick off here to form this double bond here. In fact, it's a trans double bond with the carboxylate groups trans to each other across this double bond. Instead of producing FAD, NAD+, we're reducing FAD+, here, to form FADH2. And the delta G naught prime value is close to zero as well, therefore it's reversible. This enzyme, succinate dehydrogenase, is embedded in the inner membrane, inner membrane of the mitochondria and is actually one of the key electron donors into the electron transport chain. And when we talk about the electron trans transport chain, this protein is referred to as succinate coenzyme A, succinate coenzyme Q reductase. But here, when we're talking, in the, talking about the Krebs cycle, we are going to just refer to it as succinate dehydrogenase. But I just wanted you to see that this enzyme is dual functional. It converts succinate into fumarate while at the same time almost immediately donating its produced FADH2 
its electrons into the electron transport chain. Okay, so we still have our four carbon compound. We're slowly working our way back to oxaloacetates. Um, next reaction is fumarates into malates. Again, as I've been stressing, the delta G naught prime value is close to zero. We're taking these small steps back to oxaloacetate. And this is also commonly known as a fumarate as a hydratase because we are hydrating this double bond. I mean, here, we form our, here we have our hydroxy group rep representing of that. And so we have a four carbon compound with a hydroxyl group. We form malates or malates, however you want to pronounce it. And lastly, to get back to oxaloacetate in the eighth reaction, we produce it, we oxidize it to oxaloacetates. You can see the hydrogens we pick off are right here. Um, and we reduce NAD plus to NADH. Unlike the three previous reactions where the delta G net prime values were close to zero and easily reversible, this is incorrect. It's actually clearly not reversible. It is highly positive delta G naught prime value of 29.7. And it is the high free energy release from citrate synthase reaction that drives this reaction forward. There is no ATP or any other high energy intermediates coupled to this reaction to make it more favorable. The citrate synthase hydro um, free energy hydrolysis is sufficient enough. So great, we, re we have reformed our oxaloacetates to which another, it can be condensed with another co acetyl-CoA to form some more energy carriers. So to recap, we have formed from one molecule of acetyl-CoA two NADHs 1 FADH2, 1 ATP, and this is all from 1 acetyl-CoA. But if you remember from glycolysis, glucose was split up into two molecules of pyruvate, which are converted into two molecules of acetyl-CoA. So essentially, this all has to be multiplied by 2, to show how many energy intermediates we gain from one molecule of glucose. So really, it's 4 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATP. It's the high energy um, electron carriers here that are most important, not the ATP. We're creating 6 electron carriers per molecule of glucose to be donated into the electron transport chain for oxidative oxidative phosphorylation, which is in fact our next me metabolic mechanism we will explore next.